Hello everyone and welcome to my channel. In today's video, I'm going to show you the different ways in which you can open KTM. I will also show you the GUI, that is the graphical user interface of the software. I will also briefly mention about compatibility and file types. Although I have mentioned it in the past, I will briefly explain it again. I will also show you how to navigate the workbenches. There are different workbenches within KTR. I will show you how to navigate those workbenches. In the end, we'll also talk about mouse and transformation pad. I will show you how to use a mouse effectively. In case you don't have a mouse, I will also demonstrate how to use the transformation pad. So let's begin. Since you're using Windows, I assume that you will be familiar with the desktop icon and how it works. After KTI is installed, a desktop icon is placed on the desktop. You can double click on the icon and it will start KTI. Now keep in mind that KTI is a heavy application and it will indeed take some time to open. So be patient while it opens up. Here you can see KTI has opened up. Let me just close this so that I can demonstrate the second method. Now when I double clicked on the icon, what it did is it started a process in the background which is cnext.exe. That is what opened the application. I can also start this process from run. I can type the command which is cnext.exe and this will also open KTR. Let me just close this and demonstrate the third method. The third method is basically that you start the task manager by using control alt delete key combination and type the process name from there. That will also start the application. Now these are three different ways in which you can start KTR. Now let us have a look at the GUI that is the graphical user interface of the software. Before I tell you the parts of the GUI, let me just tell you that KTR by default opens up a file whenever you open it and we need to close this file. Now you can close this file using this close button that is just below the main button. The main button is for closing KTR while this button is for closing the file. You can close this file and then go to start, mechanical and part design. Now this will open up a file that we desire. From here we can give a name to the file that we want. Now let us look at the different parts of the GUI. Starting with the application window. The application window is the place where everything is contained. The red cross that you see on the top right is the application window. And within this window you have your main menu, your work area, your specification tree, all the toolbars all the planes, everything is contained within this application window. If I close this window, KTI will close. Now main menu is the place where your toolbars like file, edit, view, insert, tools, etc. are present. This is basically your main menu. On the left, what you see is the specification tree. You can also see that the name that we gave to the file is also there at the top in the specification tree that is demo part. The three planes that exist by default, all the features that you create for the part will be documented in this tree. This tree will contain the history of your part, basically everything that you do with the part will be documented here. On the top right what you see is the compass. The compass actually serves many purposes. Some of them we'll discuss today, some of them we'll discuss when we do assembly. On the bottom left portion what you see is the prompt zone. The prompt zone actually give you a message when you hover your cursor over a tool or say you select a tool it will give you a relevant hint. The purple blue area that you see is the work area. In this work area you have three planes x, y, y, z and zx. The white squares that you see are actually planes. On the bottom right portion what you see is the power input box. Using this box you can go into power input mode and issue a command directly as you do say in AutoCAD. So this will work as a shortcut. If you don't want to select the tool from the GUI you can simply enter the command from this place and 
select that tool. We'll see how it works in a moment. Now what you're seeing me drag are actually toolbars. I can drag these toolbars out of their position using my left mouse button. And I can double click on these toolbars and these will then go to their default position. So if you want to bring them out, you can use your left mouse button and bring them out. And to restore their position, what you can do is you can simply double click on them. Now some of the toolbars in KTR are in horizontal position. The ones that I'm dragging out basically are in horizontal position as you can see. But you can change their orientation by dragging them using the left mouse button to right hand side. As you can see that when I drag them out now, they are in vertical position. So their orientation is changed when I drag them out from the left hand side. You can also change their position by using the shift key. While dragging the toolbars, if you press the shift key, it will change their orientation. So there are two ways in which you can change the toolbars orientation. Either you press the shift key while dragging them or you can basically take them to vertical or horizontal preset positions. Now let us see some of the things that I've already discussed. I will start with the power input box. You can use the power input box to invoke any particular tool. All tools have a certain shortcut. You can find out a tool's shortcut by hovering your cursor over that particular tool. For example, if I hover my cursor over this sketch toolbar, you can see its shortcut that is C colon sketch is displayed on the bottom right corner beside the power input box. Likewise, if I hover my cursor on this point reference element, its shortcut that is C colon point is displayed. Likewise, you can find out the shortcut of any tool by hovering your cursor over that particular tool. The power input box is not very commonly used, but of course you can remember shortcuts of commonly used tools so that you can invoke them directly using this box. Now let us see how the compass works. To demonstrate that to you, we'll first need to make a sketch and we'll make that sketch using the power input box itself. Now to invoke the sketch command, I'll need to use the shortcut C colon sketch. Let me just enter that. Now you can see that the tool is highlighted and it is shown in orange. That means that you're ready to create your sketch. Now, if you see on the bottom left portion, it is showing you to select a plane so that you can make a sketch. You can select a plane by using the left mouse button. You can either select the plane by directly clicking on it in the work area or you can select the plane by clicking on it from the specification tree. After you select the plane, your view will be oriented perpendicular to that plane. I will discuss the sketcher in more detail. For the time being, just follow what I do so that we can see how compass works. Now I'll create a rectangle. And exit the sketcher using the workbench toolbar in which there's a tool that is exit workbench. Now this will again take us to the part design workbench. Remember we were creating a sketch in the sketcher workbench and now we are in part design workbench. If you're not able to understand any of these things that I'm doing, it's perfectly okay. I will be demonstrating how to use the different workbenches and how to navigate between them. So if you're not understanding, simply just follow along and do what I do so that you can see how the compass works. You will be able to understand some of these things later on. Now I will add some material using the pad 
toolbar that you see here. Now after I have selected this tool, what I can do is I can select this sketch I can select the sketch that I want to add material to I can now say OK and you can see some material has been added now how compass works is if I take my cursor and hover this around the compass you can see that different parts of the compass are getting highlighted right now if I take my compass and click on this particular portion and drag my compass while I have clicked on the left mouse button remember I have pressed the left mouse button and this is while the button is pressed I'm dragging the mouse now you can see that I'm able to rotate my part around the y-axis okay so what if I want to rotate my part along the x-axis what I will do is I will take my cursor and I'll click on this particular portion and then now when I drag my compass I can rotate my part around x-axis now this is how you basically rotate parts around different axes if you want likewise say suppose if I want to rotate my part around the z-axis I can take my cursor to this particular portion click on it and drag my mouse so this will start rotating the part around Z axis right now what if I want to move my part in YZ plane what I can do is I can take my compass here so that this particular face as a whole is highlighted I can click on this and I'll keep moving my mouse so that my part actually moves in YZ space now remember your part is actually not moving with respect to planes but it is moving so that you can see the part better right as you can see that the planes are also moving along with the part likewise if I say I rotate the part the planes are also moving along so this is just to manipulate your part so that you can see it better this is how you can use the compass now what if I want to drag my part around a particular axis say I want to drag my part along Y axis what I can do is I can take my cursor and click on this particular part that is the Y axis I can then drag my part along Y axis remember I have clicked on that particular portion and I have keep the left button pressed and then I'm dragging my mouse so this is how you drag your part around along a particular axis likewise I can drag my part around along Z axis so this is how the compass works another thing that you can do with the compass is that you can rotate your part freely how you can do that is if you see the top portion there is a small sphere if you click on the sphere using the left mouse button you can now if you move your mouse while the left mouse is button left mouse button is pressed you can freely rotate your part like I'm doing right so this is the way in which you can use the compass now let us see how the transformation pad works if you don't have a mouse but you want to say move your part as I was doing with compass if you don't have a mouse say suppose you are on a laptop and you want to manipulate your part or how to do that for that you'll go to tools options and then in the in the devices and virtual reality option that you see here within the general tab right here if you click you can see if I go to tablet support you can see there is an option to activate the transformation pad if I click on this I can activate the transformation pad now where you want to place the transformation pad you can you can do so using this pad position option if I select this right button 
the transformation pad will be shown on the right of the screen. You can also decide on the pad size and pad transparency. This is these are some additional options that you can use. But let us just see how it works. Now I have activated the transformation pad. When I click on OK, it will show you this transformation pad. The topmost portion that you see this is for rotating the part if you click on it now I'm using my left mouse button you can if you have mouse you can use the left mouse button to rotate the part if you are on a laptop laptop also has two buttons so you can use the left button to rotate your part Likewise, I can pan the part using this particular portion. If I click on this particular portion and and basically move my mouse, you can pan the part. Likewise here, if I click on it and move my mouse in left and right direction, I can zoom in and out of the part, right? Now I'm using this transformation pad using my mouse you can also use the transformation pad using if you are using a laptop so this is how basically the transformation pad works now let us move on to the next topic which is which is compatibility I've already mentioned that KTR supports forward compatibility and not backward compatibility so if you have a file say suppose it was created in v5r18 you will be able to open that file in v5r19 and the file will work fine you will be able to see the parts history and anything that you have done with the part but suppose if you have a part which is say created in v5r19 and you try to open that part in v5r18 that is a previous release of the software the file won't open but you won't be able to see the parts history that means it will be a dump solid now if you don't know what a dump solid is dump solid is basically where you don't have a history of the part you won't be able to see how it was created now of course we'll see these things in detail uh, when we proceed to next lesson or maybe next to next lesson You'll see how the history is and how it works. For the time being, it's just enough to understand that KTR supports forward compatibility and not backward compatibility. Now, KTR actually has different file types. Now, this is just to tell you so that you are able to recognize the file type just by having a look at the extension of the file. This is something that KTR manages on its own. So, suppose if I create a part, a solid or a surface it will be a dot cat part file right this will be done automatically by KTR you don't need to worry about it I'm telling you this just so that you can recognize the file immediately after you are able to see after you see the extension of the part likewise say suppose there are multiple files and an assembly has been created that particular file will have a dot cat product extension Likewise, if it is a process, it will have a .cat process extension. If there is a special material that you have created or all materials within KTIA have a .cat material extension. An analysis file, suppose if you have a part and you have analyzed it for stress or any other thing, it will create additional files and those files will have a .cat analysis extension. If you create drawings, that will have a .cat drawing extension. So this is about the file types and compatibility. Now let us move on to the next topic, which is workbench navigation. Now let me just show you how we actually navigate between the workbenches. I've already mentioned that when you open KTIA, there is a default file that opens up. Let me just show that to you again so that you can see again. So to demonstrate that, let me just close this application and reopen it. So I'll reopen KTR.
here you can see that there is a default file that has opened up and suppose if I save this file I save it using control s and when I try to save this file you can see that it is showing me save as type cat product right so this means that this is an assembly file basically that has opened up by default assembly file or a file in which you can do other sort of things that file has opened up right if I save it it will be saved as dot cat product file I don't want to save it I, this is just so that I can demonstrate you the kind of file that opens up by default so let me just close this now I close the default file that opened up because it was a dot cat product file that means it was an assembly file uh, so I close it since I need to work in SketchUp and to work in SketchUp I will need a dot cat part file right so if you are working in part design workbench if you are using surfacing if you are using SketchUp for that you will need a dot cat part file now this is something that KTI manages on its own so you can simply create a file to create a file you can go to start mechanical part design either you can go to start mechanical part design or you can go to SketchUp right remember you don't have to go to assembly design because it will create a dot cat product file right we need to create a dot cat part file so we'll go to either SketchUp or part design let me just open it so that you can see I'll first use start mechanical and part design right I can give a name if I want to say suppose I give it a name demo and say okay now this has opened a file right and right now I'm in part design workbench right so this is one way you can create a dot cat part file say suppose if you want to see uh, if it is really a dot cat part file I can use the key control s to save the file and you can see it, it's showing me that it is a dot cat part file I won't save it right now but you, if you want to save you can save it right now this is a dot cat part file right say if I went to SketchUp start mechanical and SketchUp right here also so suppose if you want to give a name you can give a name I am not giving it right so this file is also a dot cat part file right uh, if you want to see I'll use control s to save the file you can see right but this is a dot cat part file the only difference here is that when I went to start mechanical and sketcher this tool this tool that is there is selected by default right now it's deselected because I press escape let me just show you this uh, if I go to start mechanical and sketcher this tool will come selected by default that means it's ready to take you to this sketch if you want to but if I press escape key ESC it will escape that means it will cancel the sketch command right that is the only difference so you can go to either one either you go to start mechanical part design or you go to start mechanical design sketcher it will create a dot cat part file which we want right you can also create a dot cat part file by using control n right that will also create a cat part file and to create a cat part file you will need to select this part okay you need to select this part and say ok remember if it's if selection if in the selection dialog box you only have p and say ok nothing will happen ok so you you have to select this ok and say ok but to browse suppose if i want to go to some other file like press g it will it will take me to another another list of type right say suppose uh, I press another key say s right it will take me to a shape file so if I press ok it won't start you have to select part so that you can see part here in this dialog box and say ok okay and if you want to give a name you can give a name uh, say suppose I want to give a name okay the file is not saved to see if it is really a dot cat part file you can press ctrl s or you can go to file save okay it will show you that it is a cat part file.
right so this is what we want we want to create a dot cat part file and save it okay so just to recap i'm showing you once again you can either go to start mechanical part design or you can go to start mechanical sketcher right either will create a dot cat part file or you can use control n and go to part this thing okay and press ok so all these three methods will create a dot cat part file which we want now now let us see how we navigate between workbenches i told you that i'll show you how to navigate between workbenches now once you have created a file i'll also recommend that you save it even though katia has an auto save functionality but i'd suggest you to save the file using control s and i'll go to desktop since this is a file that i want to work in i'll give it a name say demo and save this file right now this file is created and saved before i show you how to navigate between workbenches i'll show you how to check the workbench that you are in right now okay you have a workbench toolbar and in this toolbar you have this icon you can hover your cursor over this icon to see the workbench you are in right now right now i'm in part design workbench so it's showing me when i hover my cursor over that icon it shows me that i am in part design workbench now if i go to another workbench i can go to start mechanical and sketcher right now when you go to start mechanical sketcher it's not taken you to the sketcher workbench but it is ready to take you to the sketcher workbench you can see that this icon has highlighted now right so if i press this oh sorry if i select this plane or this plane any plane from this area or here it will take me to the sketcher workbench okay so right now i am in sketcher workbench okay i can start sketching you can see the tools that are available for sketching and in the workbench toolbar you will see there are two options one is that shows you that you are in sketcher workbench when i hover my cursor and other is to exit that workbench you can either exit the workbench using this button or you can go to start mechanical part design okay you can either use that tool or you can navigate using start mechanical part design okay so this is how you navigate between workbenches i have shown you that how to navigate between say part design and sketcher workbench now what if right now i am in part design workbench but i go to start mechanical and assembly design what will happen can you think since assembly design workbench requires a dot cat product file it will open a dialog box it will open a new file let's do that can you see that now i actually have two files right so if you have a particular file type opened up you can only go to a certain workbench right i won't confuse you with this let me just close this so just to understand if you are in dot cat part file as you can see here you can go to certain workbenches and those workbenches are for our case we'll understand that you can go to part design workbench you can go to sketcher you can go to shape in which you can go to generative shape design and some other workbenches we'll see so you, you can go to start shape you can go to freestyle okay freestyle will also require dot cat part file you can go to generative shape design okay that will also work in dot cat part file so with a cat part file you can navigate between workbenches as you can see me doing now the purpose of this navigation is basically so that you can create a certain part or a certain feature of your part in a certain workbench then you can navigate to another workbench create a certain feature there then you can navigate to another workbench you can create a feature there like like this this is what navigating between workbenches allows us to do that we can model a part with collective use of different workbenches okay so this is how we navigate between workbenches using the start button okay 
Now let us move on to the next topic which is using mouse and transformation pad. We have already seen how to use the transformation pad. Now let us see how to use the mouse. The left mouse button is used for selection as we have already seen. We have selected a sketch using this. We have moved the toolbars using a left mouse button. Left mouse button is also used for multiple selection. Let me just go to the sketch and select a plane so that I can create a sketch. Let me just create a rectangle, just create a circle, right? Let me just create a ellipse as well, right? So this is, these are three entities that I have on my screen. I can use my left mouse button for multiple selection as well. Now if I select this, right, it's only selecting one line. But how can I have multiple selection is by using the control key as you do in Windows, right? You can use the control key and use the left mouse button to add as many entities as you want in your selection bucket, right? So that is how you can also use the left key for multiple selection along with control key, right? Let me just make a window using the left mouse button like this as we do in Windows, right? I'm creating a window, multiple selection and using the delete key on my keyboard to delete all these entities. Right. Remember, I am in Sketcher Workbench, and that's how I'm creating these entities using Profile Toolbar. Right. I'll explain these toolbars in a lot more detail when I discuss Sketcher. For the time being, just to make you understand how different things work, I'm using these tools. So follow along. Left mouse button can also be used for persistent command mode. Right. Now. Let me just create a rectangle again by clicking on this and create a rectangle. Now you can see that as soon as I created the rectangle, the command closed. After I made a single rectangle, the command closed because I single clicked on this rectangle tool, right? Now what if I want to create a series of rectangle? You can create series of rectangle by double clicking on this rectangle. I'll double click. When I double click, I can create a rectangle but you can see that the tool is still active it does not exit that tool the command is still present right it is still activated now I can create another rectangle I'll create another rectangle I'll create third rectangle fourth rectangle like this right so the command will stay activated unless you press escape key or you select that tool again right you can either press escape key or you can select this tool again or if you can select another tool if you want right so that will deactivate this particular command. This is how you go into the persistent command mode by double clicking on that tool, right? Similarly, you can create series of circles. Let me just double click on this circle. Now, if I want to exit, I'll select this circle again and I will exit that command. That's how you create series of circles right so you can use this command to do anything right I can create series of fillets I can create series of ellipses I can create series of splines like that right that is persistent command mode activated using double click right now let us see how to use a middle mouse button Suppose if I have a part here, I'll create a part by going to part design workbench. If you're not able to understand this, it's okay. I'll discuss this in a little more detail when I discuss part design workbench. For the time being, let's see how mouse works, right? So the middle mouse button, which is your scroll, you can press that scroll and move your part as you want, right? So this is how panning works. This is the same way in which we use this transformation pad. If you click in this center area, you can pan your model. Likewise, you can pan the model if you press the middle button. Remember that I have pressed the middle button. I have not clicked the middle button. So click means that you press the button and you release it but in this case i have pressed the button and i am panning the model using the middle button okay 
Now let us see how rotation works. While the metal button is pressed, that means while you are panning the model, you can also press the right button. That means when both the buttons are pressed, you can rotate the model. Okay. So to rotate, you'll need to press and hold down both middle and right buttons. So while both the buttons are pressed, I'm able to rotate the model. Now while both the buttons are pressed, if I release the right button, I'll be able to zoom in and out of the model by moving my mouse up and down. Okay. So while you are in the rotation mode, if you release the right button, you'll be able to zoom in and out of the model. Let's see that again. I press both the middle and the right button to rotate. And while I am in the rotation mode, I release the right button to go into zoom in mode. Okay. And then I move my mouse to zoom in and out of the model. If you want to go into rotation mode again, while you are in the zoom in mode, you can press the right button and hold it. And then with your mouse, you can go into rotation mode. Okay. So you can switch between zoom in and rotation mode with the release and the press of the right button. Okay. If you release it, you go into zoom in mode. If you press the right button, you go into rotation mode. Remember while I'm zooming in and rotating the middle button is always pressed. Okay. So that is how you pan, zoom and rotate your model. Okay. Now, what if I want to change the center of rotation or the center of zoom in and out? If you middle click on a certain point, that point will actually go to the sphere center about which you want to rotate or zoom in and out, right? Previously, it was zooming in or rotating it about a random point. When you middle click on a certain point, it will change that point to the sphere center and it will zoom in and out of that particular point, right? So if I try to rotate it now, you can see that it is rotating about that point about which I middle clicked, on which I middle clicked, right? So now if I try to zoom in and out, rotate the model, it will do it about that point. Let's see that again. If I middle click on this particular point, suppose, you just middle click here. Now, if I try to zoom in and out or rotate, it will make that point as the center and it will rotate as well as zoom in and out about that particular point. So that is how you zoom, rotate and pan all of those things. Now, the last thing we'll discuss today is the contextual menu. As the name implies that Contextual menu is something that will depend on the context in which you are in. For example, if I right click here on the XY plane, it will give me a certain menu. Okay. This is based on the context in which I am in right now. No tool is selected. So it's giving me this particular menu. If I right click here right now in the work area, it will not give me any menu. But suppose if I go into a sketch, try to create a sketch. Suppose if I create a rectangle, and now if I try to constrain it using this tool and now if I right click while I am creating this particular dimension or particular constraint, so it will give me this particular menu, which is a contextual menu based on what I was doing, right? So if I want to change the type of constraint that I'm applying, I can make a reference from here. I can change it into angle. I can allow a symmetry line. Okay. So all these things I can access using contextual menu. So right click actually provides us several tools while we are in different context. So right click is used to access the contextual menu. Okay. So we'll see all these things as we proceed. That's it for now. And in the next video, we'll see how to create sketches in a lot more detail and we see the specific tools that are available for SketchUp. If you like the video, please give it a like, share and subscribe. Thank you for watching.